So chapter two, we've moved on to the social exposome. Never underestimate the effects of social, environmental stress that gets under the skin and is psychological stress. It becomes biological. And so while we're not going to have mechanistic talks on that link, you're now going to hear from uh, three speakers. First, Eric Prather. And Eric is an associate professor here at UCSF. He is, his research is award-winning many times over. And he studies the effects of stress and sleep on the immune system. He's also moved into larger scale research. He's a key player at UCSF in precision medicine. He is the PI of a UC five campus study called Stress for UC, which is the dissemination of a meditation app to look at the effects on health. So thank you so much, Eric. It's really great. I, my, my role here is to kind of set the table for what the, the social exposome is and why I think it's important. And in doing that, um, I want you kind of to reflect on, so it is, it is 11, or it's 1039 right now. So you've been up, you know, you've had your day up until this point sitting in this room. And so I want you to really try to reflect on kind of what those experiences have been, because this will help illustrate what I mean by the social exposome. So, you know, for instance, where do you live? What neighborhood do you live in? Is it a safe neighborhood? Do you share it with um, other people in your home? Um, you know, is your windows uh, barred or not? And then when you woke up this morning, thinking about the context in which you live, who you share your bed with, your family, your partner, alone, your cat, um, kind of how was that sleep for you, kind of waking up? Did you feel restored? Did you feel like you were ready to take on the day and come to this so symposium and take notes and you know, it become galvanized around the importance of, of environmental exposures? Or was it kind of a little, little less sleep than you need? Something that's kind of near and dear to my heart. Um, I, I myself have two little kids, and so, you know, I, it's like human alarm clocks at like 545, no matter how the night goes, right? And maybe you're in the same boat, those experiences. And then getting here, how did you get here, right? Did you walk here? Enjoy the sunshine as you kind of stroll down California Street? Or were you in gridlock traffic on the Bay Bridge wondering like, why did I come across the Bay for this? Um, you know, did you listen to the radio? Did you do a carpool and to chat with someone? All of these things, we have so much variation in our exposures throughout just that little bit of time from when you woke up to, to when you came here. What did you consume? What was breakfast? Right? Was it the fruit outside? Was it the, I dropped my kid off at the, the daycare here? And my goodness, it was donut day. Yeah. <laughs> like, I was like, ah, but I was a little stressed, you know, I had to give this talk, and I was like, maybe just a little, a little donut. <laughs> One of those delicious donut holes. Incredible. It was, it was worth it. Um, you know, and then kind of the connections that we have. How many people have you chatted to today? Have you chatted to the neighbor in your seat, right? Did you, how many people have you smiled at? Or have you kind of been in kind of a grumpy mood because of the traffic you were in, and maybe you're just like head down, going to go about your business, right? The connections, the people, the community, all of those exposures. And then finally, of course, kind of what else is going on? You know, what about the, the stress that you're carrying, the burden of your job or, you know, finances or, um, you know, what have you, all of these things, all of these exposures are the social pieces and behavioral components of our world, right? Um, and that was just from when you woke up to right now, right? <laughs> Imagine how that plays out across the day, across the week, across the month, across the life course, right? All of those things build up and we think of those in addition to kind of the environmental toxicants that we're exposed to as, you know, the complete package of what is the exposome, right? But the social piece is so critical. And we think of it as embedded, you know, and in multi-layered. And so, so we've been working with this, this triangle here where, you know, we can focus on the individual and the individual risks. But then, of course, that's embedded 
inside of kind of where we live and who we live with and who we work with and all of those types of aspects. Those, of course, are then embedded further in the neighborhoods and the communities, both neighborhoods in place, but also the communities that we build. You know, now with the, um, the advent of, of social media, our communities have gotten a lot bigger, right? You can stay in touch with people all around the world, and those are pieces of exposures that, that we are now beginning to quantify. Those, of course, are embedded within institutions and then in social economic policies. What state do you live in? What, what uh, district do you live in? What country do you live in? All of those types of policies shape our experiences. And so when we think about how it's related to health, as, as Dr. Lowenstein talked about, you know, we can think about it as a triangle going up the other way, where we start at the base of the genome and then all the way up through the proteome and met metabolome and the organ systems. Right? And that's where we spend a lot of, a, at least in a biomedical system, that's where we spend a lot of time and a lot of investment in those processes, trying to understand that basic science. But ultimately, we see it as this, as this pyramid, these, uh, this hourglass in which, you know, the, the outside world connects with kind of these biological underpinnings. And so if we think about how the original exposome was, was developed, and so it was, it was first coined uh, by Christopher Wild back in 2005. And it, it really kind of is captured here where there's the social experiences and the external experiences kind of interacting with one another. And we certainly know that kind of social uh, tr insults can interact with chemical exposure, putting people at, at additional risk, which then gets into the body at various levels to impact our health. And as was already mentioned, you know, these social exposures are not randomly distributed, right? So we know that individuals that live in, say, uh, poorer neighborhoods are more likely to be exposed to lots of other uh, social exposures that don't happen at the same frequency in neighborhoods that are um, a little well off, more well off. And what this provides is just a whole lot of data, right? And it can be overwhelming, all this data that we can gather. But thankfully, it also provides an opportunity when we think about all of the, the types of things that we can begin to measure and start to use big data analytics to make some sense of this. And so these are things like the electronic health record. We've done a lot of work in this space trying to, you know, uh, enrich the electronic health record for a variety of social and behavioral factors so that we can begin to study this and follow people over time. But then you can imagine that other data that, that I'm sure will be talked about, like geocoding, where people live, we can get a lot of information about where people live and all of the other things that they might be exposed to. But then, you know, for good or for bad, people are able to kind of now take uh, social media data to help try to characterize individuals. And then, you know, in the consumer space, this is certainly happening. Amazon's a great example of this, kind of knowing exactly what you click, when you click it, and anytime you go to buy something, you know, they use a lot of algorithms to say, you know, someone like you might also like this, right? But those are all kind of social information about who you are in time and space that can help us understand how that's related to your health. And some of this work is already being done, and I'm just going to kind of give you two quick examples uh, because I'm short on time here. But uh, the first is very much related to kind of the, the metabolic health of the obesity epidemic that we've already discussed. And so this is kind of using a deep learning technique to try and estimate um, prevalence of obesity without actually using obesity information. And so this was a study that just came out this month, and that's why I'm, I'm highlighting it, where they, did a, they used machine learning, which we'll probably hear a little bit about today, and I certainly am no expert, but you know, where they used 150,000 high-resolution pictures just from Google Maps, and they extracted it to get information about built environment characteristics, like number of parks, you know, parking lots, you know, apartments, street, street level stuff. Um, and then they used that information to see if they could predict obesity rates, which they already knew from kind of Center for Disease Control information. And it's incredible because here is the predicted prevalence just based on that geocoded information from Google Maps. And here's the actual prevalence. And it's a little hard to, to see on this screen, I understand it, but if you look at the paper, it's almost identical. It does an incredible job, right? And that's a huge opportunity to help us understand the exposures that we have in our world for obesity. And it's also being used outside of the research setting, which is a little bit terrifying, but I just wanted to point you to this. This is a, an expose that ProPublica did about 
big health insurance conglomerates kind of scraping the internet to help develop risk uh, algorithms for who they bring into insurance companies or not. And so if you want to hear more about that, I, you can just Google search this, this story, but it's a good example, but in the, the health insurance space of where the social exposome information is, is being used. But of course, in research, we're also doing this, and there's some good examples of this that I just want to point out. Um, many of them are kind of public private partnerships, so universities, so the project baseline, I don't know if anybody is an enrollee in this, is a, is a long-term study of individuals and it's a, it's a collaboration between Stanford, Duke, and Verily, uh, a Google company. The Human Project is looking at 10,000 people in New York, and then the NIH, the, the uh, Precision Medicine Initiative supports the All of Us Project, which is um, trying to assess one million participants to get all of that uh, biological data, those layers that I talked about, but also trying to enrich it for the, the, other, the other part of the pyramid. Um, so that will provide an important data set for us researchers to better understand how the social exposome um, plays out for health. And so just to close, you know, I hope I've illustrated a couple of points. So the social exposome is large. It's vast. It's possibly boundless. The exciting piece of it is it's also dynamic. It takes different disciplines to come together to help us understand what we need to measure and how best to measure it. Um, and it's interactive uh, in this instance, thinking about environmental toxicants. But I think most important, I think, is that it's required, right? Not including it is not sufficient. And so it's required to fulfill the promise of pre precision prevention and treatment, which we call precision health. And so I'm excited to hear more about kind of the, the, from the other speakers, and I'm, I'm happy to take questions I probably after, after all. And then I just want to thank the Center for Health and Community, Nancy Adler and Maria Gleemore, who helped in this uh, work, and it was supported by the Social Science Research Council. Uh, we held a meeting on the social exposome uh, last year. So thank you. <laughs>